Welcome. Welcome to the RSA. I'm Sue Pritchard. I'm director of the RSA's Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. And just before we begin, could I ask you to make sure that your mobiles are turned to silent. We're filming and uh, live streaming over the web. So welcome to everyone watching online. Uh, and a little reminder for those of you that tweet, our hashtag is hashtag RSA Eat. And if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter, please do. We're anticipating that we may get some questions from the live stream that'll be relayed to us via our um, social media bods in the audience. Now, housekeeping notices over. I am delighted to introduce tonight's special event presented by the RSA Food, Farming and Countryside Commission and City University Centre for Food Policy Food Thinkers Seminars. The London launch of the Eat Lancet Commission report, Food in the Anthropocene, is the first global full scientific review on what constitutes a healthy diet from sustainable food systems and which actions can support and accelerate food systems transformations. I am really pleased to see a large turnout for what promises to be a lively session. This was the most rapidly oversubscribed event that the RSA has hosted for some considerable time and we have over 350 people on the wait list and dotted around the building, which I think is a measure of the importance that people attach to this critical topic. Farming for the health of people and the planet in line with the sustainable development goals make up two of the five themes the Commission is investigating at present. We believe the UK's farmers and the countryside have huge potential to contribute more to our health and well-being, but often this apparently obvious link is ducked because it's on the too difficult list, where the tensions between consumer choices, market forces and government policies are most felt. But things are changing, and we welcome Minette Batters, president of the NFU's stated aim for UK farmers to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. But nonetheless, WHO World Health Organization says that an unregulated global food business is now the main driver of food poverty and planetary breakdown. More than ever, we need to forge progressive global alliances to respond to these pressing global challenges, which is why we were so excited about the Eat Lancet Commission report. It's radical, it's controversial, it challenges us to think very differently about what we eat and how our food is grown. It sets out a global transition plan for healthier diets and farming systems over the next 30 years. The Food, Farming and Countryside Commission wants to help shape what a UK transition could look like in partnership with the people who grow and produce our food and to connect the way we farm, what we produce, more effectively with improving people's health and well-being and in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. And we also want to take up this challenge with a clear-eyed perspective on how sustainable change really happens. This means talking to people with all sorts of different views, and different perspectives, working out together where we all want to get to, and most importantly, agreeing some practical steps to get there. We need to find our common ground and a path towards a shared future. So please share with us your thoughts and help us make that progress tonight. So I'm going straight to our panel. We have a lot of ground to cover this evening. We've brought together panelists from the Eat Lancet Commission and expert contributors to discuss and debate the report findings. First up, we'll hear about the report findings from Dr. Sandro DeMeo and Professor Tim Lang. Sandro is Chief Executive of the Eat Lancet Commission and Tim is Professor of Food Policy at City University, among other things. Dr. Marco Springman, with the distinctive hairdo, is Senior Researcher at the Nuffield Department <laughs> of Population and Health at Oxford University, and he'll be presenting for us some of the emerging UK-specific data in the context of the report's findings. And we'll then open up the discussion to our other panellists. A very warm welcome to Baroness Rosie Boycott, journalist and food campaigner, Dr. Alison Tedston, Chief Nutritionist at Public Health England, and finally Helen Browning, Chief Executive of the Soil Association and a Food Farming Countryside Commissioner. We're very keen to hear comments and questions from the floor and we will open up 
the conversation after our discussion on stage. Sandro, are you ready to I take am. the floor? Thank Good. You. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm going to actually watch with you rather than looking on the iPad. I hope that's okay with our hosts. So first of all, thank you very much to the Royal Society of the Arts and also City University uh, Centre for Food Policy for hosting us tonight. Uh, my name is Sandro. I'm the CEO of EAT, the foundation that hosted the Secretariat of the Lancet Commission. Um, this is one of three launches that we have happening today around the world. Uh, as we speak on Capitol Hill in Washington DC, we're briefing senators of the US government and we'll host an event this evening in the Norwegian Embassy of, uh, in Washington and also in Maputo in, uh, in Mozambique with everything freshly translated into Portuguese uh, this weekend the generous donation from UNDP, uh, we have a launch happening there. These are three of about 40 launch events that are happening around the world. So to understand the Eat Lancet Commission, you need to understand the context. And for many of you as experts, this is not new news. Um, but in short, we're not bending the curve on the big environmental challenges happening to our Earth and to our planet around us. The number of dead zones in our oceans is rising. CO2 emissions rise year on year. In turn, global temperatures rise, deforestation and uh, biodiversity loss. But at the same time, and a shout out to Corinna as former chair of the Global Nutrition Report, a co-chair who was instrumental in bringing this data to the world, together with UN agencies and governments, we know that we have a major crisis or a major challenge facing global nutrition worldwide. One in two people on the planet, a planet that has never been richer than it is today, continue to wake up every morning malnourished. 830 million people every morning have no choice but to wake up hungry. That number is rising, a sad indictment on our global community, and rising because of conflict and climate change, to a large degree driven by or exacerbated by uh, food insecurity and food system challenges. We know that one in four to one in five children continue to be permanently stunted. They will never reach their full potential across their life course, their intellectual, their physical, their emotional, and their economic potential because of hunger, protracted hunger in the first years of life. A very, again, a very sad indictment on our global community. But at the same time, two billion people across this planet, two billion with a B, wake up every morning overweight or obese, consuming too much of the wrong types of food very often beyond their immediate control as well. So the question we posed th three years ago was, can we feed a growing population a healthy diet and have a safe and prosperous planet to pass on to future generations? So the Eat Lancet Commission took a four-phased approach. The first, and it's important to understand, the first, it defined a healthy diet based on all of the available global evidence. Not opinion, but a, a, uh, a very comprehensive review of all of the epidemiological evidence that we have worldwide, all of the interventional evidence that we have worldwide, and we came up with, or the reviewers, the, uh, sorry, the commissioners came up with the uh, reference diet. The second, qu the second question was then to pose planetary endpoints. So we had dietary endpoints for what was an optimal diet for a global population. The second question is, what can a planet entertain uh, at a planetary scale with regards to our food system and defining hard endpoints that would be sort of the, um, the, the, uh, the line in the sand for the global um, environment with regards to uh, environmental impacts. The third was then the work led by, uh, or so instrumental that uh, Marco was involved with and will tell us more about in a moment, was then modelling different scenarios to work out how we can achieve health for all, how we can achieve the SDG goal of leaving no one behind and achieving a world where no one is malnourished but still having a planet that is safe, prosperous and sustainable to pass on to future generations. And then of course the fourth question of how we achieve it. So the diet is a 2500 calorie diet which is a dramatic reduction for many parts of the world including uh, the part of the world we stand in the moment. And it generally, at a glance, looks something like that. Half the plate is fruits and vegetables, uh, zero to 10% uh, of total calories coming from uh, sugars, but the vast majority coming from uh, fruits, whole, uh, fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, and seeds. Healthy uh, oils, and then small amounts of meat and dairy, although 
the reference ranges also uh, do go to zero and it was uh, acknowledged that you could also be a healthy diet, could be uh, achieved on uh, no or little, very little amounts of meat. If we compare this to the global current intakes, we see a dramatic difference between the uh, health boundary, the reference diet, which is our um, dotted circle, and then what the globe is actually uh, currently consuming. What is more interesting is probably for this part of the world, which is quite similar to the North American diet, we see a dramatic overconsumption of red meat, of starchy vegetables, of eggs, of poultry, and of dairy. We see a dramatic underconsumption, though, and there's a huge opportunity there for our food systems and our rural communities to provide greater amounts of fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. The picture looks quite different in South Asia, and we've got a similar uh, graph for um, other continents. But you see, again, slight overconsumption of starchy vegetables, but otherwise, actually, the, the message is, is quite different. Uh, and particularly for many, many um, of the poorest parts of the world, it will involve consuming more animal source proteins, and particularly for young women and children, or at least uh, as part of uh, a healthy diet, along with increases in, uh, again, fr uh, fresh fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts. In terms of the uh, target two, so that was the dietary target, this is the environmental targets. You can see sort of the headline um, headlines on the right hand side, but it's uh, zero expansion of land use, uh, no new emissions and net um, uh, absorption of uh, CO2, uh, and also um, leaving half the planet uh, intact by ecoregion. And then finally, it outlined five strategies. Um, and of course, the question is how, and this is what uh, Tim will talk about in a moment. But the first strategy is around shifting populations to healthy diets. So this will be very different for different parts of the world. I should mention also that the reference diet is not a set uh, dietary pattern. Um, it is, it is a, uh, it is food based group, a food group based. Um, it's highly uh, uh, adaptable, and it it needs to be adapted to every local culture, um, and it's highly flexible. It is of course a flexitarian style diet. The second is to align agricultural priorities and to shift from a focus simply on quantity to also producing the right types of food in the right settings for the right populations. The third is looking at how we close uh, yield gaps and increase the productivity of, what we've, of the land we've already converted to uh, croplands and uh, for the use of agriculture. The, the fourth is strong and coordinated governance of land and oceans. This is an area where increasingly focusing on the oceans was under a focus in, the in, in this current commission. Um, and the fifth is around food loss and waste. With a third of food wasted in low and middle income countries, largely pre-market in the form of food loss, and in countries like this and where I'm from, mostly aftermarket in the form of food waste, uh, we will not be able to solve this challenge without solving the global challenge of food loss and waste. And on that note, I hand over to you, Marco. Thank you. Um, Is that over? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, does this, this mic probably doesn't work very well, but uh, it does? Okay, great. Um, yeah, since we're in the UK, I thought I'd uh, flesh out some of the results and findings uh, for this country. Um, and in particular, I want to compare how does the Eat Lancet Planetary Health Diet compare what we already have here, uh, which is the Eat Well Guide. Uh, if you look at how consumption needs to change by uh, 2030, then you see uh, this flexitarian planetary health diet would need to lead to very drastic reductions of about 90% in beef and pork, uh, over 60% in poultry and dairy, almost 50% in eggs, 60% in sugar, and very high increases in fruits, vegetables, and legumes. Uh, in comparison, the Eat Well Guide doesn't actually quantify so many uh, strict targets. It has a nice picture, but it only tells you don't overeat, uh, eat maybe two portions of fish, uh, five fruits and veg a day, 
And if you eat very high amounts of red, uh, red and processed meat, maybe limit that. So those are the only things that are in there, and therefore you see zeros here uh, in a couple of places. What does that do to nutritional status? And here again we looked at projections to 2030. Um, you see that um, if nothing much changes, we run the risk of having too many calories, too much saturated fat, too little folate, too little iron, too little potassium, and too little fiber. In the Eat Well guide, uh, if people ate according to that, uh, you would improve that somewhat, but uh, still a residual net uh, um, um, discrepancy would remain. Whereas if people move to this uh, flexitarian planetary health diet, uh, those uh, nutritional uh, low intakes or too high intakes of some of those um, nutrients uh, wouldn't be there. Uh, what would happen to uh, diet-related mortality? We know in this country the second biggest risk factor for uh, mortality is uh, um, intake of imbalanced diets right after tobacco. So it's really um, a huge portion that every year uh, die due to uh, basically shit diets. Um, what would uh, the eat well di uh, diet do um, to, uh, to, to counter that? Well, it would lead to a reduction of about 2% in terms of premature mortality. And again, because the targets are not very strict, not so much happens. Whereas if you compare it with the flexitarian uh, eat lancet diet, we would get up to a reduction of about 10% uh, uh, in premature mortality. If you add in there the uh, recommendations on healthy body weight, you can approximately double that, you, so you go up to 20. Uh, what does it do to environmental impacts? Well, again, you see that um, there would be some reduction in environmental pressures in the Eat Well Guide, but uh, most of those can be double, doubled or tripled uh, if we move towards flexitarian diets. So you would, for example, have a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that are related to climate change by uh, over 70%. And 25% reductions in lots of those other pressures like cropland use uh, and fertilizer application. Uh, now a good test for whether something is a good sustainable diet is to check what would happen if, every, if everybody in the world ate such a diet. Can we actually recommend a diet like this? Uh, and we found that the offset between the Eat Well Guide and the uh, uh, Eat Lancet Diet would be approximately 3 million uh, uh, additional deaths uh, in the world. So uh, if, if you, we would recommend the Eat Well Guide uh, all around the globe, we would have 3 million avoided deaths less. Uh, and uh, in addition, we would exceed planetary boundaries, especially those on climate change and nitrogen application, by 60% uh, and almost 20%. And that is mostly due to the lack of stringent recommendations on red meat intake. So um, what can be done to move uh, the UK diet uh, towards, healthy, uh, towards a healthy and sustainable diet? Well, I would argue start with the official dietary guidelines, uh, in particular quantify targets for each major food group, and that includes uh, maximum uh, um, intakes for meat and dairy and, uh, um, and, and minimum intakes for fruits, vegetables and other uh, health sensitive crops. Uh, and the second thing is important, take those seriously. I mean the Eat Well Guide is there, yet over 70% of Brits don't meet the five a day recommendations and over 60% are overweight and obese. How can that happen, right? Uh, apparently nobody cares about those dietary guidelines. So I would say to the ministries uh, and uh, really uh, get serious to do something about it. We calculated that the value of the saved lives you can get uh, through to the, uh, due to dietary uh, changes would be approximately double the budget of the NHS. Uh, and that is in a classical cost-benefit analysis. So uh, clearly there is a huge benefit attached to those dietary changes. So uh, ministers do something about it. And then lastly, uh, uh, and that goes also to ministers, we, we need proper agricultural incentives to transition towards, more, towards nutritional and climate sensitive food production. That means a reduction in animal, um, and animal agriculture and an increase in, in plant-based uh, agriculture. With that, I hand over to Tim. Thank you. <laughs> to be absolutely honest, I can't remember what slides I've got up here. So <laughs> let's see where it is. How do I do it? Uh, as marker. Uh, is this you? Yeah, that's still mine. That's still marker. Okay. Um, the 
Eat Lancet Commission report was actually a great privilege to be in for three years, unpaid. Very interesting. <laughs> um, you, we're in Britain. We've got this enormous change process being mooted by the Eat Lancet. I was the head of the policy sort of wing of it, and right from the beginning, there was a debate that went on in the commission. Do we ignore this? Do we just say, let someone else do it? Do we say nothing really needs to change, a little bit of a tweak here and there? Is it big change, little change? Is it about changing consumers but let farmers do what they like? Do markets sort it? You know, this is very complicated. Welcome to the real world. In the end, we decided to basically not be prescriptive. This is a report which does not say this minister should do this, Sue should, as a farmer, do that. Instead, we ended up giving very broad strategies. And those are in black there, which uh, Sandro gave at the end of his talk, the five strategies. So the last quarter of the report is basically around those. You can read it whether you're a borough market street trader, looking at borough market people, or a nutritionist, or an NGO, or a government, or a minister, or a sector of the food industry. The idea was there needs to be a great food transformation. The world cannot go on doing this. And let me just say, this report has had huge publicity. But actually, it's in the tradition of lots of others. Indeed, today, another one is published by the Soil Association, the IDRI report, which is broadly coming to the same conclusions. Differences, but broadly, massive reduction in meat and meat production, huge increase of horticulture, and a transformation of what people eat. We can't go on eating as though we're Americans, nor can we carry on eating as though we're Malawi. Okay. The world is poised between those and has got the damage from both of those. That's what this report is about. In red is me beginning to think about Britain. I'm in Brexiting Britain, so are you mostly. Um, we're in a mess, in case you didn't realize that. <laughs> uh, just checking that you're still awake. Uh, we have lots of pointers in the report. Lots of positive stories of people and countries doing bits of change. But the point of the story and the point of the policy section is it, it's not big enough, it's not coordinated enough, and it's not joined up. In, in my language, rather than ours in the report, although there's a bit of it I managed to get in of me, uh, it's multi-world, multi-level, multi-actor, multi-sector. And at the moment, that's not happening. Um, actually, just look at food waste. Sandro ended up on the food waste. In the end of the commission, we said, actually, we, we're talking about dietary change, and there's a huge elephant in the room called waste. Food's being produced and not eaten. And now, in rich countries, it's the rich consumers who waste the food. In poor countries, it's wasted before it gets to the consumers. Broadly, that's the picture from the evidence. And in the UK, we are all over the place. All over the place. Uh, how many of you heard, uh, know that only one third of local authorities separate food waste at all? How can we be even talking about it unless we collect it and you know, turn it into biogas or something, constrain it? It's just nowhere. RAP has been cut, if you know RAP. It's been made into a business consultancy. There's nothing being said to consumers at all. I salute, actually, Alison in public, who's going to come on later, for getting the Eat Well to begin to have a bit of environment stuff. What we're saying in the Eat Lancet Commission is unless ecosystems and human health are put together and factored into everything from farm to consumption, forget it. And we've got 11 years to do it, actually, according to the IPCC, and then the report, we said, let's think 31 years. And I would just want to end by saying the good news is, none of us have said that, actually. The good news is we can 
feed 10 billion people sustainably within ecosystems, reducing greenhouse gases, biodiversity loss, and all the sorts of things uh, that people in this room have worked on, just looking around. We can do it, actually, but it needs dramatic dietary change and therefore dramatic production change. So it's a big challenge. The Eat Lancet Commission report lays down very hard figures. Other people can model, and other people are beginning to already do modeling, but they all end up broadly saying that big picture that we've come up with is, is right. Uh, my own suggestions for taking this forward, I think it's about horticulture. If I had one minute with Michael Gove, I'm sure Alison does, I don't. Well, I had 10 minutes with him. I said, firstly, you're not talking about food at all. Now you're just talking about agriculture and the environment. Great, but it's not food. Secondly, we've got to be talking about horticulture. Britain's horticulture is quietly collapsing. It's dependent upon EU migrant labor. We don't know where English strawberries are going to come from this year. There's no one to pick them. You know, let's get a little bit real is one of the big things. And one of the things we say is that we're not going to get anywhere unless we get coordination. We need a National Food Policy Council, actually, in Britain. We haven't got it. So on that note, I'll hand over. But, but please read the last 20% of the report, because it's very good, and, and it's lots of positive examples. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, so I was pleased to come here, because um, when I looked at the Eat Lancet Commission, I thought, well, broadly, the recommendations within their, their report in terms of diet are broadly in line with those of the UK. Of course, the detail is different, but the broad sweep of it is the same as the UK dietary recommendations, which are based on an open and transparent process, bringing together the best scientific evidence we can um, to create dietary recommendations, and then they feed into the, dietary recommend the diet recommendations for the UK, which are presented in the Eat Well Guide. But just to correct a few things, that it is built on a linear program model, which was developed for us by Oxford University. That takes into account achievement of dietary recommendations. And actually, all, if we were to eat the Eat Well Guide, then we would achieve all our dietary recommendations for all micronutrients and macronutrients, with the exception of vitamin D, that I don't think you're achieving in your um, guide either. But I think I want to step away from arguing about that because the reality is that whatever dietary recommendations any country has, the population doesn't achieve it. Changing the dietary recommendations does not change the nation of a diet, the, di uh, the diet of a nation. In the UK, like many countries throughout the world, an increasing number of transition economies and certainly many cities now in the developing world, we have an excess calorie consumption. In the UK, we have adults consuming just on average um, two to 300 calories a day more than they need. Our children up to 500 calories a day. Um, so yes, we could argue about the detail, but actually the, t the direction of travel throughout the world is the same. If we are going to change what nations eat, we need to think beyond just telling people what to do. We need to think through structural policies, um, and that includes not only thinking about agriculture, but also thinking about the rest of the food chain. In the UK, like in many other countries, agriculture is a small portion of the food chain. The majority of it is in manufacture, retail, and increasingly the out-of-home sector. We have managed to convince ourselves that things that we used to have as very occasional treats, now are regular everyday events. And that is not happening because of the dietary recommendations. That's happening because of economic drivers that um, are incentivizing um, and um, um, pushing us as individuals towards buying and consuming too much. 
So the UK is taking this seriously. I am very proud that we now have the second childhood obesity plan. That is, the f that is we now have a cross-government commitment to trying to do something about this. We know it is the start of the journey. We know that we will need to do lots more things. But in the UK, we now have a large sugar levy. We have, we have um, um, in the chapter two, the childhood obesity plan, an intent to control price promotions. When you go around a supermarket as an adult, you are having your purchases controlled by the retail environment. So government is trying to do something about it. Hopefully we will have soon um, a consultation on the nine o'clock watershed and putting in similar controls on advertising um, across, across the um, internet. This type of deep structural approach is needed. So with due respect, arguing about the detail of um, what's in people, different people's advice is kind of missing the point. To drive change, we need um, substantial things to happen. Um, and government is often dealing with um, conflicting pressures, employment. Their food sector is the biggest employer now in the UK after, after the public sector. It's very important for UK GDP. So decisions on this are complex for pol pol politicians. And I'm sure Rosie will talk about that now. She's in the House, House of Lords. You are weighing up complex things. Um, so anyway, that's all I want to say. So we welcome it, but please don't get distracted by arguing about the detail. Did you want to say anything in the middle? I was just going to say, Rosie, that Alison has kind of hit the nail on the head, hasn't she? We oh. have a huge issue of overproduction and overconsumption. And the default position that it's all down to consumer choice, and if we can just persuade consumers to buy differently, might somehow solve the problem. I think Alison's saying very, very clearly, we have to move away from that as a strategy. What's your thinking on um, that? I'll stay sitting down. Well, my, my thinking is I'd first like to say that I haven't been in the House of Lords for very long, <laughs> but I did get lobbied the other day, and it was an incredibly fascinating process. I was lobbied by Innocent Drinks, who are very keen to not end up with their products within the nine o'clock watershed. And they came and saw me and my friend, Dan Jenkin, and they gave us a squeal for about 45 minutes about why it was absolutely fine to drink as much fruit juice as you want and that it was not like drinking a sports drink. And I, thankfully, because I listened to Alison and I read it all and I know it, was able to combat this. And after it had been going on for about 20 minutes, there was a man from a PR company. i would forgotten his name, even if I could remember it. He was very, very smooth. And I said, um, what do you describe this process, this meeting as? And he looked at me and I think without thinking, he said, neutralizing the opposition. And I said, oh, are you serious? Did you really say that? And then I wrote it down, and I could find it for it. It's in this notebook. But the power of that, and when, when I first came into the Lords, the second thing that is very interesting to say about how the food companies work is that there was a debate on obesity given by, called by somebody it was, who didn't really know very much about it, and 14 people spoke. And of them, apart from myself and two people on the Labour front bench, not one person mentioned the industry. Everybody else spoke about education, parents, and schools. So it was the person's fault. It was not the industry's fault. And it was an incredibly revealing moment to me. And I thought it was the only time I thought, actually, I deserve to be here. Because they really have been brainwashed. And what Alison says is right. I mean, this is about capitalism. Let's get real here. This is about making money. And, you know, yesterday there was all that stuff about Primark clothes and we have to tax them because they're now throwaway. Well, food, if you follow a capitalist model, which all politicians want, is about producing more product made from cheaper ingredients. You apply that to nuts, bolts, T-shirts, bathing costumes, whatever. We also apply it to food and we see where it has got us. The disaster now of exporting this disease, the Western diet across the world, is really horrific. I was at SOAS the other day and they showed me a map of Africa and they said, this is where women start going into the workplace. Within a nanosecond, the fast food industry is in there. And as Alison says about the out of home, they come in and they offer you to be easy. 
It is easy. It is cheap. London has eight and a half thousand chicken and chip shops. What will you do when you've only got a quid? I sit on the Food Foundation and we found that in the bottom 20% of poverty in this country, it costs you over 54%, up to 74% if you're in the bottom 10% of your disposable income every week to afford the Eat Well diet. This is not the Ritz, fellows. This is the Eat Well diet. It's pretty simple. So we have a problem of poverty. We have a problem of politics. Politicians do not want to countenance rising food prices. And they give in to industry all the time because they say we'll keep the prices cheap. So that means you squeeze the farmer up and down the chain and you end up with, a, Tim has got this figure, 8.7 billion goes to the farmer out of about 300 billion in the food system. Okay, anyway, it's disgusting. It's a lot. It's a lot. So, okay, so we need more than, a ra we need such a big radical change. And I think one of the ways you do it is we have an agriculture bill. It doesn't include food. It has to start including food. You have to get people to see joined up policy that the cost to the NHS now is a burden beyond a burden. But like the, you know, because of the Paris climate talks, we have started to look at alternative ways of energy. We have found another way of making money for the industry. And I think that while we remain, you know, thinking, gosh, yes, we can all kind of grow nice stuff and feed the world, we have to say, how are the Cargills of this world going to react? Well, we're going to give the Cargills so that they don't carry on driving us all. They don't give a damn about where we all are in 40 years' time. They care about their profits next week, like the politicians do. So I think we need to take this debate to a much more complex level, but it really looks into political systems and money systems, because that's what's driving it. I mean, you know, yes, I think this report is fantastic, but I do also agree with Tim that we have been here and we kind of know what we need to do. And what gets ducked is how the heck we do it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's get into the how-do. Helen, you are the only profitable farmer on this panel. <laughs> and not for I'm, much I'm not a profitable farmer. I, I'm, a, I'm a small farmer. Um, and I heard you this morning on Farming Today talking about the enormous investment and risks that you are taking, uh, investing in future food systems. We're really concerned on the Commission to make sure that farmers' voices are heard and farmers feel part of creating and shaping the future. Do you want to say a bit more about, about that? Yes, well, I guess, you know, this report has been quite controversial in some quarters, particularly with farmers. Mm. Um, bec and, I, and I really understand that as a farmer myself, because mm. it's a pretty terrifying time to be in farming. Mm. Um, not only mm. have we got this Brexit thing about to kind of turn our world upside down, but there is this uh, great mandate for change, and I welcome it mm. enormously, the fact that we're getting this kind of sense of uh, common ground around where the direction of travel um, but for those people and uh, as a farmer I'm one of them who have investments in the world we need to shift from um, I've just invested in a new dairy for instance um, that uh, is, 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 is really tr it can feel really tricky so I think the, uh, the work that the RSA um, is going to be doing through this commission on transition is going to be particularly important, to be working with farmers to think, what's it going to take to go from here to where we need to go uh, once we've completely logged out what, you know, what, what it is we're trying to transition to? Because I think taking these global, this global picture and translating it into what's right for the UK uh, is a very important piece of work. Every geography is different. And uh, I think it's not necessary always to think, uh, if you've got great rainfall and great grasslands, uh, it may be appropriate to be producing uh, ruminant livestock somewhere, even if you're not eating it all there. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought the Idri paper, um, which uh, Tim mentioned earlier on, was quite helpful, actually, to think, uh, what's ecologically appropriate to be producing across Europe for a healthy diet, for a healthy population, and to try and make sure that we're getting uh, that perspective alongside the big global picture that I think Eat Lancet brings. 
So I think that there is a real need for long-term investment, um, both at the consumption end, all the things that Rosie and Alison and everybody's been talking about here, how do we make that transition in diets and what feels acceptable and how do we make it easy for people to do the right thing? Um, and that does mean, you know, investing as farmers, we wouldn't dream of not investing in our calves or our young animals. We don't invest in our children in the way that we do even with our animals. It's quite disgraceful. Um, so I think that long term perspective of how we will save money, how we will save ourselves all sorts of trouble down the line if we can get uh, nutrition right at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the right point in people's lives. Um, but also in farming and helping t uh, farmers see that future. I, as well as investing in new dairy, I'm investing also in agroforestry. Lots and lots of nuts and fruit trees. They will take 10 or 15 years to come to maturity. So we have to bridge that. We have to see this as a process that we go through. We have to hold farmers' hands to go through that process. And we have to show them a viable model at the end of it. Uh, that feels uh, really compelling. So I think there's a great piece of work to do now, as you said, Sue, earlier on, for us to be working with the farming community to say, what will it take to help you make this transition to producing the kind of food that we need to produce, to produce in the future? And we need to be working with the whole supply chain too, because farmers don't act in isolation. They are hugely influenced by their first purchasers and by the retailers too. It's a big job. But if we can build on, despite our little local differences about whether it's red meat or white meat, all these kind of things, if we can build on a mandate for change and, a, and, and, a, and an understanding of the direction of travel, then I think we really can start to lobby our politicians to make sure that we have the right policies in place and that we are investing long term rather than the short termism that has led us to where we are today. So I'm, I'm going to open it out for questions in just a second and to help our team out I'm going to take a block of three questions from this side first and a block of three questions from the middle and a block of three questions from my left um, but I'm going to start with chairs privilege while you organize yourselves into your questions and just I guess pass the challenge back to the Eat Lancet Commission team we've been talking about huge global challenges not just about changing what's on people's plate and I think as I, as I mentioned in my opening remarks World Health Organization says that an unregulated global food business is the biggest driver for um, planetary and public ill health what kind of strategies have you got within the Commission to start to craft a more progressive global alliance that is able to tackle those huge forces? Yeah, I think it's important to understand what the Commission set out to do. The Commission set out to set a North Star or a blueprint for the world's food systems. And for the first time, something we didn't have was to put that in the context of planetary boundaries. So what, how can we feed a global population leaving no one behind, the SDG agenda, within a safe and prosperous, mm -hmm. sustainable planet to pass on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an, an important thing to understand. It wasn't the how, it was the what. And we mm -hmm. needed to have an agreed what at mm -hmm. the global level. Mm -hmm. I've just come from three years at the World Health Organization mm -hmm. yeah. and I've seen the worst of industry mm -hmm. uh, and how they influence uh, policy all the way down to the consumer. Mm -hmm. But we needed to have a, an agreed end point to work towards mm. beyond the SDGs 2030, because this will take mm. a period to, this is, this is not going to be a quick shift, this is going to have to be a slow transition. And what we are now focusing our, um, our eyes on as an organisation, because EAT, this is one of our projects, we have many, is the how. Um, we've just launched with Chatham House, a global commission, on how, on what this means in different jurisdictions around the world for policy makers. We have a co-owned or co-hosted global network of 55 cities in the C40 network, looking at what this means for cities. We're working with the city of Copenhagen to develop uh, science-based targets. Um, we're working with a number of companies. We're working with chefs. Uh, and we host a global forum every June, co-hosted by the governments of Sweden and Norway, aimed at bringing together a 1,000 of the world's food system leaders and continuing this conversation. But what we found was we can build the table 
with enough time we can bring the right people to the table, but we have to have an agreed menu before we embark on the how. And then we need to do many of the things that you're talking about. I mean, policy is going to be critical. We, we're, we're very often scared, and, and we have to be very conscious of the language we use. I've learned the hard way. The policy is not a word that many people like outside of probably this room. But policy is going to be critical, responsible government in fixing the market, in realising we externalise many of the costs like we do in energy, and that that is driving market failure, resulting in obesity across the planet, making the wrong types of food artificially cheap and deferring the payment of the cost, which will come at some point yeah. until tomorrow or beyond. Whether it's energy or whether it's obesity, it's the same market failure derived from a broken economic system. Mm. But the, 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 what the Commission set out to do was not the how, but the what. We needed to have an agreed North Star. Great, thank you. Well, let's take some questions from the floor. I'm sure there are many. So we'll have a question from the front here, and then um, the lady with the lovely golden bangle that I can just see above, and then just behind her. So it's three women on this side to start with. That's lovely. Christine Elliott, Chair of Borough Markets, Tim pointed out, I commit my tenure at Borough Market to pushing forward action on this agenda. And my question and challenge back to the group is, we haven't got 30 years. So year on year, what would you and what would you have us do to move this on now? Because we have to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to take all three questions at once, please. Uh, thank you very much. Madiha Emmet from uh, Canada's International Development Research Centre. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great panel. My question, and, and we touched on po points of this, back to the policy and the how, um, regardless of the value of capitalism as a driving force and the profit motive, um, whatever economic structure we're in, we tend to take that as an assumption, but it's a result of political choices. What we tax and what we spend it on in terms of subsidies is the economic structure within which all our industry and our economic and our individual choices are made. So it's actually very relevant and very much within our country con national control on who gets subsidy, how it affects farmers, how it, which private sector, large firms versus small and medium enterprises, small farmers benefit. So that. We touched on it a little bit, but I think a little bit more conversation about this would be really interesting. Thank you. And then behind you. Hi, I'm just a normal person, but <laughs> I, I was wondering what um, influence the sugar, the sugar industry had in the 1960s when they demonized fat. And they basically said, yeah, sugar is healthy, so now we have an overconsumption of sugar. And that probably contributes to the obesity and kind of all the sugary treats that we think is normal to consume every day and how that affects um, the perception of what a healthy diet looks like. Mm, thank, thank you, you, thank you. So we've got three sets of questions. A challenging question, what is the year-on-year -year action plan that we need to commit to and not be putting off actions into the future? What kind of taxing and spending regime do we need to organise as a country? And perhaps that third question, what do we learn from history? What do we learn from those historical efforts to reshape what we grow and what we eat and make sure that we don't get caught on that um, patam one more time. So I'm going to bring that over to this side, to the, to the two folk in different parts of government. Let's start with you, Alison, and then perhaps you, Rosie. Um, so um, I can't, not even I was around in the 1960s to be able to answer that question. But I think what we have to remember is that we're having an excess of calories from a whole lot of different sources. And sugar has been, for policy make, for what's happened in the UK, sugar has caught the imagination. There's been an evidence base that will survive, which is really very good. Um, and it's been an easy, um, not an easy, it has not been easy, <laughs> but it's been a, it's caught the p political imagination and there's been, and, it, and we've been able to kind of break through on that. Um, but, um, Public Health England, where I work, um, at the moment is being quite criticised for talking about the need for calorie reduction. Um, and we're getting criticised because people are saying, take your hands off our pizzas. Reality is we are consuming too much and we all pay for that through our taxes. I think sometimes we muddle up freedom of choice mm -hmm. 
versus the cost to mm. society. And I've got a question for the Commission, actually, while I'm at it, <laughs> I, while I'm talking. Um, one of the things that slightly worries me is that here in countries like the UK, we've got a health infrastructure, and we have a very... Um, we, um, so, so, we, so type 2 diabetes has the potential to clip uh, for the NHS. That's one of the reasons government is getting engaged in structural, trying to change things through structure, structural approaches. Many countries do not benefit from having a health system. Mm -hmm. the, the, when I look, obviously my interest is the UK, but there's an ethical dimension to how I think as well. And when I look around the world and I see what, how quickly obesity rates are changing in transition countries, that Nairobi now has as many obese children as London, um, and, and yet we... It is terribly slow to say that we will wait because I, I think it is very important that the learning that we have generated in, in places like the UK about this, we, we are, the horse has bolted in the UK, we're trying to pull it back. There are opportunities around, around the world to stop the horse from bolting, but the time to do that is we haven't got very long to do it. When you look at how quickly fast food chains are moving into countries, and that will greatly change things. I think you need to move a bit faster, chaps. That's what I'm really coming down to. Um, and actually, I would argue that actually, around the world, Dutch recommendations are much the same everywhere. They're not that different from the ones that you have produced. So I think, I think you might want to use your power to start really getting very quickly into the policy space because if poor countries go through, let's try education, let's try a bit of food labelling, let's try a few voluntary agreements, and then in 20 years' time, you finally get to the do, trying to do something about it, um, that will be a massive problem. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Rosie, if you had, from the tax and spend question, if you had tax for one regulatory lever, what might you... Well, I think that's a kind of impossible question to say one, but I mean, I would yeah. can just quickly picking up on what you... The person who asked about the, the sugar thing, I think history is very interesting here. It took 50 years from when people, doctors knew that cigarettes killed you till you got the first warning on a packet. That was industry lobbying. And, and my little <laughs> lobbying story is as nothing as to what goes on around the world and in, with governments. So, Alison is absolutely right. Guys, you need to get a move on. We need to get behind this policy and we need to see through this. I mean, if I could do one thing or two things, one of the things I would do would be immediately try and ban all advertising for unhealthy food everywhere if I had a magic wand. I mean, I was with my step-grandchild in Singapore not that long ago. She had 180 different little cartoons on her laptop. She's six for Peppa Pig. Mm. You know, this is Marks and Spencer's healthy food. Um, and it, it is really distressing. I mean, we're up against the fight about the nine o'clock watershed, but they fight very hard and they fight very dirty. But two point, only 2% 2 of advertising is on healthy food. You know, that's, that's just one thing. Yes, I would tax fast food much, much higher. Yes, I would put local regulations on all fast food shops so that they, instead of, you know, the moment they can't kill you quickly by, with botulism, but they can bloody hell kill you slowly. <coughs> And we don't do anything about that. There are a million rules and regulations that need joined up government. Um, again, industry likes it all siloed, likes no one in charge. It's like we had a situation the other day in Feeding Britain when we, we found out there's no minister in England responsible for hunger. It doesn't <coughs> technically exist. Thank you. Tim, you wanted just a couple of seconds. Yeah, very we'll very quickly. <coughs> Let, let's just get clear. The Eat Lancet Commission is a medical journal commission. Can I just put it back into its box? Uh, um, it was set up by the Lancet, a medical journal, to say, can the medically associated problems associated with diet dovetail with ecosystems' impact of food systems? That's what it was doing. Okay. The fact is, at the end of the report, 
it says, look, this is much bigger than just medicine, public health, and ecosystems. And if we want to deal with those things, it's got to be the great food transformation. Actually, we're talking about it. That's ex precisely this sort of process is what the commission was wanting to encourage, going beyond the medical world. Um, very quickly on the issue of production, the, the person over there about production. Since 1944, the policy of the UN and all member states has been to increase production. All the financial signals have been to produce more. The assumption was by producing more, you deal with all the public health problems. The, the, the reality is for the last 15 years, solid evidence has emerged, and we are but the latest okay, in a long string. It's very well modeled and number crunched. But it's the latest of a long string which say that policy is dead. It's got to stop. You've got to have nutrition and public health in the heart of production. Production's got to be tamed in all the sorts of ways we're now talking about. But finally, it's got to be a process like this. But we haven't got any institutions which enable us to do it. With great respect to Alison, Public Health England is not a democratic body. It's an advisory, scientific advisory body to ministers. It's a non-ministerial departmental body. What we haven't got is a body like this. We haven't got a forum. We haven't got anything which allows that to happen. And one of the things in my little talk, if you looked at the slide, was actually England is the problem because Scotland and Wales are beginning to do processes and it's now gummed up because of Brexit. But whatever happens with Brexit, We've got to sort out England. England's got no mechanisms for dealing with food policy at all, yet. which bring things in yet. 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 Mm -hmm. So let's, let's would just indicate to me in this group, if you'd like to ask a question, while Marco just briefly, says a couple of words, so we'll take you. Uh, to the time you. Uh, the, I just want to briefly highlight some numbers. Uh, even if we look at 2030, there need to be massive reductions in, uh, in animal source foods, even in low-income countries. That gives you an understanding of how fast things are moving. So yeah. we need to do uh, start now. And um, I agree we need to focus on all kinds of interventions, but it needs to start with proper dietary guidelines. And uh, uh, with all due respect, those uh, modeling results, they're in an appendix in a technical uh, document. So there are no quantified targets in the main document. And you need proper dietary guidelines to take uh, policies forward because they are very often uh, refer they are very often refer to those dietary guidelines. On the capitalism thing, we estimated that if you would take into account just the climate dam future climate damages and put them on the price of foods, uh, beef would need to be 40% more expensive, dairy 20% more expensive. Prices if you go up. if you take the health costs into account processed meat would need to double in costs. So there are massive, uh, massive changes that need to be done. Uh, and again, we have the data to do those things. Those are probably medium term things, but we need the discussion now and we need, to, we need to start with it. Lastly, the sugar question, I think that is a perfect example of how a focus on one single item uh, leads to unintended consequences. So we need to think about diets uh, as such. What are the good things in diets? What are the best things in diets and move that forward? Mm. Okay, thank you. So let's take some questions from the floor. We'll start here. Uh, yes, thank you to, to all the panel. Uh, my name's Charlie Payton from Seawater Greenhouse. But um, a sort of suggestion, but a question. Um, the NHS have been mentioned a few times um, as bearing the brunt of the problem. But in my experience, the NHS are the worst offenders when it comes to nutrition and diet. <laughs> Giving advice on diet, very good to give pills and to do surgery, but absolutely hopeless on, on the food they serve. Mm. And next question was... I uh, have a question for um, San, San, Sandro. Um, the two commissions are, are in general agreement, but I do see a difference between the two. Um, in reading the RSA report, as he referenced to supporting regenerative farming. Um, however, in the Lancet report, the emphasis is on sustainable intensification. There is a difference there. In 2013, the United Nations Commission on Trade and Development suggested the idea of ecological intensification. And that's more a measure of what's needed in this revolution. Um, if you want healthy food, you need healthy soil. If you want healthy soil, you need crops 
and animals integrated. You need agroforestry. You need silver pasture. You need intercropping. All these things are really urgent in the context of agriculture producing five gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions each year. Thank you. To, Thank for you the that. next generation to have a prospect, mm. carbon emissions must begin to fall in 2020. Yeah. Thank you. And there was one more question over here, and then we'll invite the panel to respond. Hello, um, my name is Will Nicholson. I work for the Food Foundation. Hi, Rosie. Um, and the Food Climate Research Network. We're doing a lot of work at the moment with investors to help them to map the risks and opportunities of their asset holdings under you know, what, what you're referring to as the, the great food transformation. And uh, the, the risks that they're most concerned with are regulatory risks and, and legislation. And the opportunities they're most concerned with are, are consumer demand shifts. So a key part of all of this comes back to everything that you've already said quite a lot about is, is policy is, is the, the strongest lever. Um, now, investors work on maybe a five-year return. You know, they're, 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 they're built in a capitalist system to be interested in the short term. Um, if we've got 12 years, from a political perspective, that's, that's another six years of Donald Trump, four years of Bernie Sanders, and then someone else. In the UK, we can maybe squeeze six or seven prime ministers in in, in that 12-year <laughs> period. But, but they work on the same time frames as the investors. They're interested in five-year cycles. So how do we break that system lock-in? How do we, how do we fast-track it so that we actually get things done with, within a couple of prime ministerial cycles? Lovely. Thank you. So a real range of questions there from public procurement, the role of public procurement for the public plate, picking up the questions around agroecology in the Eat Lancet report, but also the role of divestment, how um, investors can use the power that they have to change corporate behaviours. So I'll, I'll start with Sandra, but I think... Can I say something about public procurement? You can, can and, and you can. Mm -hmm. And Helen, you can say something That's about fine. agroecology. Okay. How about that? <laughs> So we'll start with you, Sandra. The question sure. is directed at you. Well, I don't think it was a question. It was a comment, and I completely agree, and I think the Commission does too. So I'm happy to talk about that with you afterwards, um, but we agree. And, and the role of soil is, uh, in, its, uh, in its function is uh, fundamental. Yeah, fundamental. fundamental. Soil health and uh, its role in capturing and storing carbon. Um, Which is why we've got to change the diet to protect soil. Yeah, but, but we can, yeah. So... If we've miscommunicated, we can talk, but uh, we completely agree. Um, on the investors, I also uh, think there's a huge opportunity uh, in the investor space. The, there are investors. We, last year at the Stockholm Food Forum, we brought together 35 investors. We sort of looked across the ecosystem and the investor ecosystem, and we looked at who were large investors for, for whatever reason had a longer uh, lead time for their investments. And there are actually examples. So pension funds, they, they're invested in the long term. Health insurance funds, they're invested twice because they're invested in the long term, but they also don't want a world where three quarters or four fifths of us are overweight or obese. State-owned pension funds. Norwegian Pension Fund is the single largest investor on the planet. It owns 1% of global share market. It's owned by the Norwegian people. Last year, they divested from anything, with UNICEF's help, they divested from anything that had child slavery in, in the, its supply chains. Uh, and they, they applied a, a framework to their investments. They were able to shift markets and shift uh, behaviour in companies in a way that we only wish governments would step up and do uh, through a shift of their investments and with that financial flows. So I think there are huge opportunities of finding investors that have large portfolios and are uniquely in, invested in the longer term view and working with them to reformulate big parts of the food sector. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Sandra. I'm going to scamper down the line here so I can get some more questions in before we have to finish. I'm going to start with you, Alison, on public oh, uh, So uh, I, we absolutely agree. I mean, um, there are two areas, I think. So there's the NHS, which clearly is a very big procurer and seller of food. We have seen progress under that. Now, now 
the NHS should procure everything in line with a standard contract, which actually does take into account sustainability, uh, locality and um, nutrition. Obviously, it could be better, and, and um, it is an example of, um, uh, um, of um, something that is out there but is not necessarily enforced. The other big one is our schools. We have school food legislation that means that schools, our children should have, the, have food within strict standards. That is not always applied, and I think we are we are underutilizing the plow of public procurement. People find it very boring, but it's one of the things we absolutely should get right. Our children have the right to the best possible food. And we have just a quick plug for our Welsh work as part of the Commission. We have a whole project between Welsh Government and Welsh farmers on improving the relationship between public procurement for the public plate and local yeah. farmers and growers in a really, really practical way. So absolutely support yeah, that. Because Sandra said oh. much of Yeah, and on that front, I, mean, I think the pressures on public procurement are getting heavier again. Yeah. We're seeing the cost pressures coming in where the waiting on contracts is now swinging back into price, mm. not quality. Yeah. We're actually going backwards on that front. Exactly. Uh, which is a real problem. And within the NHS, you've got, you know, we work with our Food for Life programme in, in hospitals. Uh, it is incredibly hard to improve even food for staff. Mm. Uh, the NHS has a huge obesity problem itself. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the food quality is very, very poor for those people working and visiting as well as patients. So there's a big challenge there. And doctors still aren't talking about nutrition. Uh, you know, so we haven't got any of this stuff right. But you asked me to talk a little bit about agroecology, yeah, um, and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm pleased to have a moment to talk uh, a little bit more about the how, because I think you're absolutely right that Eat Lancet is setting out the what, the North Star. I think the IDRI report that uh, I mentioned earlier on is starting to get us into the how, um, in terms of giving us confidence that the kind of agroecological future that one or two people have been talking about in the room tonight is both possible and tenable, because I think there's always been that question mark, can we go down that road where we use far fewer inputs, look after ourselves better, improve biodiversity, and feed people well and healthily? And that report is showing, yes, it would reduce the amount of calories we produce, but it would still allow us to feed everybody healthily. We could stop importing grains and proteins from areas of the world which are where they're driving deforestation, one of the biggest uh, climate challenges that we have and biodiversity challenges, that would reduce our greenhouse gas um, uh, emissions by around 40%. Um, and, and yet we would still, out of Europe as a whole, be able to maintain exports. So I think there is a really positive future around agroecology and a more, more organic type future, um, which starts to really build into that picture. And then there's some you know, some interesting balances between the, the roles of ruminants in, in supporting the nutrient recycling and that kind of thing. But that's the detail. But I think we, should, we can start to get into a much more confident space um, on that side of things. And that's the work you're leading for the Food Farming Countryside Commission, Helen, isn't yes, it? Yes, very With much so. That whole partners. transition piece is the, is the bit that, uh, that I and David Pension are going to be leading. Um, so really keen to be working with all farmers on that one. Yes. David Pension yeah. is a public health doctor, so yeah. we're putting our practice where our theory is by integrating that in our inquiry. I'm going to take two quick, I'm so sorry, we're running out of time, I'm going to take two quick questions on this side and please make them questions, not statements. So from the front and from the cult. So we'll, we'll start there, Wendy. Hi, <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice. I'm Johanna Ralston, I'm um, World Obesity Federation. Thank you very much to everyone and um, excellent presentations. We are working with um, with Eat Foundation, we've just had the Lancet syndemic, and I wanted to um, to just sort of pose the question: How do we take what's going on with youth and climate change and harness that power for this? Nice. So it's about youth. Nice. Um, Hello, I'm Patty Rundle from an organisation called um, Baby Milk Action, and um, we've been working for about 40 years to try and stop the huge corporations. That's what's been our main focus is to concentrate on bringing in legislation to actually stop these companies from misleading parents about what is a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. So obviously I love this eat thing, but I, I'm looking with alarm at how the big... Um, I, I'm particularly worried about public-private partnerships 
and how corporations are being taken in by the UN and all the NGOs, most of the big NGOs are working funded by corporations. Mm -hmm. And we are part of that. Actually, I'm not saying we because we don't take that money, we have no money. So I, the reason I'm saying that is that your EAT thing is still emphasizing micronutrients and all the stunting and the this and the that. The companies adore that because that actually leads in to a total doubt about whether real food really works. Yeah. And so yes. it goes yeah. straight into the, the, the yeah. ultra-processed foods, yeah. straight into what they want, straight into the scaling up nutrition and all these gain and everything else that really pushes you know, biofortification. Thank you. I think we've, we've got your point. Thank you. We're just so pressed for time. It's a really, really important point. And, and the, both of those points, I think, are a, go straight to our campaigner on the panel, Rosie. Do you want to pick up and respond? Well, I, I think that the, the fact that we have got young people marching and sitting down on the bridges is the best news we've, this country's had in a very long time. And when I get depressed about Brexit, I think of the fact that there's lots of people camped on the bridge who really care. And that the sooner we can get them into policy situations, the better. But actually, they are the consumers of the planet in the future. And yes, I completely agree with you about the, the thing. I didn't realize, I mean, you're quite right. It's about reinforced milk and yogurts that have whatever it is you need. And uh, like I said, I think they're very, very clever. And they have a lot of people working. And often you feel that the food NGOs and all of us we seem to have very few weapons and very little money in our armory to attack it, which is why the need for very heavy policy has to come from somewhere. And there's just no money in real well, food, in point. fresh food. I, I mean, that's the real... Well, that's the big thing. That's it's the about, big challenge. You know, who, do, who do the big yeah. companies feel they're responsible to? Yeah. The shareholder. I mean, just on the investment thing, I mean, there is a very interesting guy called Jeremy Collar who runs Collar Capital and he has, I don't know whether he has come to eat, but I mean, he is actually managing to, he's done some really dramatic thing in Brazil to do with deforestation, working with both Tesco's and about not deforesting areas because he's got so much pension fund now that he's managed to get. So I think that is enormously positive and EAT has done a huge amount to encourage that and all part your elbow. <laughs> can, I, can I just pick up on Patty's point? Hello, Patty. Um, about, um, about confusion. Yeah. Because I think I agree that the micronutrient thing is quite a difficult, difficult thing and can lead to a lot of confusion. So in this country, mothers generally don't make the food that, that when they introduce solids to their children, they will use commercial products. And they, they are not doing that because they're lazy. They're not doing that because they're uneducated. They do that because they feel they are sure then their children are getting the right mix of nutrients. So, so that commercialization of an everyday event, the, the, I absolutely agree, the micronutrient thing just opens the door to, but it's also, to food fortification. It's the whole thing about advertising. It's telling you that you can... That if you don't do it, you're not doing the best for your child, isn't it? Yes. So, so when we buy when uh, when we buy our breakfast cereals, we are very confused often because we can see it's a high sugar breakfast cereal, but it's high in iron, it's high in calcium, it's high in what, and that confuses mm. people. And this is the whole point why we don't just need um, education. Brilliant. Thank you. I mean, what a fabulous set of questions. I'm I'm going to crack on. We are going to be able to gather. I just, want to, I just want to answer something. Really there, quick. Yeah, there's been, there's been a, a, an unfortunate rumour that uh, the Lancet Commission was somehow funded by industry. And I just want to make it very clear that not a cent of industry funding went to uh, providing this uh, piece of science. In fact, even me flying here today, everything was funded by the Wellcome Trust, a generous contribution uh, from start to finish. The other thing I would say is, as an Australian listening to this conversation uh, and a group of uh, Britons, Br British, uh, talking about what does this mean for Britain, I think we have to be really careful not to forget what does this mean for the planet. Because it's both a challenge and an opportunity at a planetary scale. When we eat what we eat, we damage the one planet that we all live on, not just Britain, but the entire planet. And if we continue to eat the way we eat, not only will we not have a planet to hand on, but we simply don't make space in the global food system for the 800 million people that currently don't have access to good nutrition. 
We, we simply have to make the space for them in the global food system by eating less and eating better quality. And I think the last thing is absolutely, it's also an opportunity because there will be parts of the world, this is not about Britain feeding Britain. This is about actually more trade. It's about one global food system because there will be parts of the world where best quality, most sustainable beef can be produced. Mm -hmm. And in other parts of the world, we need to keep that land as rainforests. Yeah. And we need to find a way to remunerate that. We need to find a way for countries to continue to develop and pull themselves out of poverty. But also, it's a huge opportunity for countries like mine and yours to grow high quality produce and export it to the billions of consumers that need to be okay, eating Sandra, more fruit and vegetables. We will be thrown out. Corinna wants to say a few words. And I oh, sorry, just, Corinna. I just want to acknowledge that it, there was a very, very large demonstration of British school children who were making those very same points yep. and asking bigger questions of us as the grown-ups in the room. Corinne, I'm just going to ask you to say a couple of words by sure, way of wrapping yes. up. And uh, thank you. Thank, uh, thanks for everyone for, for coming and thank you for the fantastic uh, panellists. But I, it was a str thanks so much for all the shout out to, to policy. Uh, I work in food policy, so it's fantastic to see that focus on what public policy can do to address this, um, address this problem. What I wanted to, what I was really sitting there thinking about, though, was about the children. And Sandra, you made this point about it's our children's planet in, into the future. And changing diets is going to take changing the diets of young children. And the people who are often responsible for changing the diets of those young children are their caregivers. And they're often women. We're asking women to do a lot. Uh, we're asking them to, to help change the diets of, the, the ch of, of their own children. And it's very, very difficult, really difficult. Any, any parent will know how difficult that is to institute a transformation. In practice, that's what, what it's going to mean. Mm -hmm. And that's going to mean changing food environments. It's going to mean changing the, the, the food system. I'm not just talking about education here. But just imagine if every government in the world had a single-minded focus on supporting the caregivers of young children, of babies and young children around the world, to make sure that those children were eating healthy diets within planetary boundaries. Then we'd see a great food transformation. So that's something I think we need to be thinking about for the future. Thank you very much on behalf of my colleagues at the Centre for Food Policy uh, for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Corinna. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Sandro, Marco, Tim, Alison, Rosie, Helen. We have an opportunity now to gather together in Rothmel's coffee house on minus two. I think it's easier. Am I right if we if we move out through these doors down to um, our long gallery where you can have um, a drink and a healthy nibble and a mingle? There are also a whole heap of reports that you can take away with you. Please do get in touch, keep in touch, talk to us about what you're, what you're thinking. It's an eco-healthy nibble. <laughs> Don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs>